<laughs> so thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm thrilled to have a sold out audience, I just found out, and next time we'll make sure we don't put the cap quite so low so that we can actually include more people who wanted to be here. It, you may not record this, you are not given permission to record this, but it is being recorded and I will tell you a bit later how you can get access to the recording. Um, today is being prepared and put together by the Responsible Entrepreneur Institute. It is done in conjunction with Bainbridge Graduate Institute and The Hub as co-sponsors. Now, I want to tell you just briefly what the Responsible Entrepreneur Institute is, and after we have done a bit of looking at today's subject, I'll tell you a little more about it and how you can follow up and stay connected if you want. But the Responsible Entrepreneur Institute comes out of my almost 40 years of work with businesses around the world, entrepreneurs and very large ones, never having worked on the idea of responsibility or sustainability or ethics or morals in any overt way, and yet, the way you work with businesses can cause them to come to that way of seeing the world without ever being argued into it. One of the things I see changing that I think is really important though is that I think that the entrepreneurial spirit, which is the basis of who at least the United States is, is beginning to be diminished by all the institutions and systems that we have and that the future is going to be in entrepreneurship, whether it's inside of an organization or whether it's you founding your own business or you doing it in your family or your community. And the entrepreneurship is what it is that we have to reawaken. And I mean reawaken because it's in all of us. I mean, we're born with it. You can see it in children. I mean, all of them would start a business at the age of two if you would let them, right? Mm -hmm. But we talk them out of it. <laughs> you know, we give them rules. We socialize them. So the Responsible Entrepreneur Institute is focused particularly on business and it is working to ensure that any entrepreneurial endeavor is able to always be financially effective and create benefit for society for all social systems with no trade-offs. If you are making trade-offs in your business it means you don't have a large enough way to look at it. I call this way of working future-proofing and competitor proofing. And what I mean by that and what the Responsible Institute is about, Responsible Entrepreneur Institute is about, is future proofing is about being able to see when things are changing, seeing when the business model needs to move, not with trends, but because of different kinds of intersections. The competitor proofing is so that you are non-displaceable, that nobody else can be you. You get so clear about who you are and what your business is about that no one else can ever displace you in the marketplace because they can never be you. So that's what the Responsible Entrepreneur Institute is about, is helping that happen. Now, it also uh, has some particular ways of working, which we're, you're going to see over this 24 lecture series, an overview of that, and I hope you'll all join us for as many as you can. We'll, we'll work to get that to happen. It is, um, we will look a lot at what it takes for you to be that future-proof and competitor-proof, that non-displaceability and that regenerative nature, by having you really um, understand the business model you need to be operating through. Because I see lots of entrepreneurs start and they pick up a business model that either first occurred to them or they saw someone else doing, or it's the hot thing of the moment, and they actually don't know how business models get constructed, which is how you go to market. So we'll be looking at that kind of thing. We'll also be looking at how it is that you build a bond with a portfolio of buyers, either distribution buyers or consumer buyers, depending on where you're going, that can really support your business having that kind of portfolio you can count on and they can count on you, right? You're in that kind of relationship. We're also gonna look quite a bit at um, how it is that you do partnerships one of the things that entrepreneurs, especially those who are moving to be responsible entrepreneurs, have to do is they never can do anything by themselves. They shouldn't even try. And yet, they, the, one of the first places they fall in a ditch is the way they partner with people. Either the way they hire people or the way they take money from people or the way they create alliances with people. So we're going to look at how it is you form principles and how you work in a way that you don't fall in those ditches. And I know a lot about that because I've worked with a few of them that have gone down. I learned a lot in the process and so did they. 
And I've worked with some that have managed to avoid it. So we're going to look at that kind of work. So we'll look at all of those kinds of things. Let's talk, um, let's talk just a little bit about the kind of um, thing we're going to be talking about here today and over the next 24 sessions. Um, I'm going to be answering 18, or no, posing. I'm going to be posing 18 questions that I think are the questions that entrepreneurs have to repeatedly ask and figure out how to get right. It isn't like you start a business, you get to ask it once and you're done. So what are those 18? And they actually come in sets of six. There are six that are related to strategic thinking. And I don't mean strategy, I mean thinking so that you strategically are doing the right thing. There are six more that are related to how you create a living competitive relationship or a relationship that works exactly in the market so that you're not trying to <coughs> work any of you of white people out or worry about whether you get wiped out. And then how you do six more, how you do work design. So those are what we'll be covering. Today, I'm going to give you about 30 minutes of introduction to the first of those 24. I'm going to then give you an exercise that you can do. Michael will be recording up until then. He'll shut off the camera. And then we're going to do an exercise so you can actually start to apply to your business right now while I'm still here in the room with you. You can answer questions and work on it. Um, I will also, just a little bit in there, give you uh, more information about where you can find and follow up with what we've done today. So that's what today should look like. You want to stay still? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so welcome to the first discussion, dialogue, around the responsible entrepreneur and what that takes. It's related to how do you grow a business and how do you grow it responsibly, but particularly how do you get the corporate direction that bounds what you put into your business and what you don't put into your business? You probably all feel that challenge. The nature of entrepreneurship, when it's really alive in us, is it is innovative, it is ideating, it's ready to do the next thing, and it begins to look like they all fit together because they came from you or they came from a small group of you. The ability to get focus deep, lasting, clear focus so that you know what to say no to is a very important thing. And most of you know that, but how do you do that? How do you get in the place that you can figure out what your direction is and your direction in a way that no one else could displace you in that direction? So I'm going to talk about what this is not. Many people do strategic thinking by doing an environmental scan first. In fact, people are taught that in business school. <clears throat> Go do all the research, find out what's out there, what everybody is doing, um, figure out which part of it relates to you, and then how you compare to them. So I don't let anybody do that. I think that is the most scattering possible process you could ever engage in. 90% of what you look at is irrelevant to you, but your mind has a tendency to get hooked by anything that looks interesting that you're not doing, because your brain is designed to see gaps. So the minute you go out doing a competitive assessment, you're going to find gaps all over the place that are not you, and that's the good news. But until you can get beyond the, the trend chain or the uh, environmental scan, it's really hard to get back to you. So I say, don't do that. The other thing people do will be trend analysis. And you can make a really good living if you just want to do trend searches and you print the trend searches and people buy them from you. And therefore, it's another one. It's a different kind of fragmenting. What it'll do is cause you to go from one thing to the next to the next because the trend is changing. You're trying to bend what you do to the trend. So don't do that. The other thing that people sometimes call strategic thinking is priority or goal setting. So what you do is you put together a set of ideas about things you could do, ideas you could work on, a set of customers that you could work with, right? And out of that list, you start to figure out, well, what would be the priority? Which goals would we have? The nature of priority setting always comes not from the essence of you, but from the reactive nature of you, the one that is trying to figure out how to react to, again, what it saw as a gap, and it comes from a sense of urgency which gets sparked in you. 
So I tell people under no condition do brainstorming. Do brain stilling. You want to get the mind quiet. You want to have it learn how to see things in a very focused, distinctive way. And that's what we're going to look at here, is how do you move to brain stilling? <coughs> I do want to give you a bit of how, this ha how we do this so you can understand what underlies this work. And we're going to do a great deal more of this as we go through the 24 lectures. The first one is that you're really based, uh, this work and the way you'll be introduced to it is based on understanding living systems thinking, which is different than what you probably call systems thinking. It is based on the life and the way systems work and interact, not based on the way machines work, which is what the current popular idea of systems thinking is that comes out of uh, systems dynamics at MIT. This is literally how living systems work. And it's taking everything that living systems know and bring them to the business as a way of thinking, as opposed to what we do now, which is to take everything that the business knows and goes and impose it on living systems. Mm -hmm. So this is about getting a living systems thinking as a way of looking at things, and you'll see more of that as we go through. You'll also see here that we're working from potential rather than from existence and trying to improve it. So what does that mean? So most of the time we talk about continuous improvement. Let's find the problems of where we are and let's improve on that next time. If you think about that for a minute, you're always working with what, what already exists and trying to move it some. That's like Sisyphus trying to push that damn ball up a hill, right? And it rolls back down. So you don't want to be working on existence. You want to be working from the potential that exists. And we'll look at how you do that, which is begin to understand how you look at a system and what the purpose in it is and how you reveal more and more of that. What your essence is as an entrepreneur and how you reveal more and more of that, which is where the potential comes from rather than all of what already exists. The third thing is that we're going to look at how you build responsibility in or maybe draw it out of every act, every thought you have rather than bolt it on. Because most responsibility right now in any business, including the entrepreneurial efforts I'm seeing start up, are creating an alternative path along which they work on the good stuff. So we have programs, we have best practices, we may have an officer, you know, we have a report and all of that's over at the side. It's not related at all to how it is that we do business and make things clear every day as part of how we think. So let's take the first one. Our subject today, and we'll take all three of these and talk about how they fit there. So our subject today is how do you get a corporate direction? And corporate direction means literally, you know the root of the word corporate? It means body of the whole. Now we've come to think of it as the big bad thing that is greedy and takes more than it deserves, extracts things from the earth while it does it, and rips us all off. I have some truth to that. <laughs> But that is not what the word corporate means. The word corporate literally means to be the body of the whole. I mean, it's why we have uh, habeas corpus. It's why we have you know, the, the sense of the, the corpus that is healthy and whole. So we want to look at corporate direction. So the direction for the body of the whole. So here are the three facets of corporate direction. They are the way, they are the way you start with living systems, you continue with living systems, and you finish every act with living systems involved. They are the way you connect with who you are, and they are the way that you find the right way to position you in the marketplace. So I'm going to take each of these and talk about them just a bit. Essence is the first one. Essence is a funny word. You shouldn't talk about that in business, right? <laughs> but I have for 40 years. Because essence literally uh, just means, I'm going to actually go forward here one so we can talk about just essence for a second. So essence is the true nature or the distinctive character that makes something what it is. So it makes you, it describes what's distinctive about you and what makes you what you are. And unfortunately, when it's described best, you won't hear it, which is at your funeral. Because then people say, or the other time you won't remember it, which is when you're a child. So I look at my two-year-old granddaughter and I would say, 
She is someday, she is so connected to nature that she can hear every sound. She can hear a cricket. She hear wind blowing in the trees. And somewhere in her, her essence is going to be related to that ability to feel, sense, and be connected to nature. But she'll forget that pretty soon in the socialization systems we have. The same thing is true of a business. It has a distinctive character that makes it what it is. And it happens at the founding. And I'll give you an example of how to do that so you can do a bit for that for your business. It also is the thing, if you take it away, then it no longer is what it is. So if I went around to each of you and I said, if I took away one thing from you and you would no longer be who you are, we'd have to peel for a long time because we have so much wrapped up in our personality and what it stands for and what it is that we think we're doing that's competitively us that we can't even find us. And I do this work with businesses always as the beginning piece of work and I have to fight them for the first several hours, weeks and days because they've got lists of differentiations, of com competencies they've developed. I mean, they have these long lists trying to figure out who they are. And none of them have to do with it. If you took that away, they would no longer be them. It is also permanent rather than accidentally something happens. So it doesn't have anything to do with how your parents raised you. It doesn't have anything to do with what was available when you started your business. I actually believe in individuals is probably there when you're born and I know it's true when you found a business because I went back with DuPont for 204 years. We found what their essence was and it fundamentally changed how they thought about business. So I'll tell you that story so you can see it. So DuPont had grown and expanded from this tiny little business it had been until it was in seven major industries. Not just businesses, but industries. Everything from chemicals to mining to agriculture. And they no longer really knew what it was they were really about. So we went back and looked at E.I. DuPont, the founder of DuPont Corporation. And what we found was E.I. DuPont used to work for the king's ammunition guy in the last reigning king in France during the French Revolution. And he was so meticulous, so careful, that the ammunition's uh, um, head for the king put him in charge of figuring out how to do everything safely so they didn't blow up the king's people, they blew up all those bad revolutionaries. But what ha two things happened to E.I. DuPont. One is he started to wonder if he was blowing up the wrong people. He and his whole family began to say, I wonder if we're on the side of where history is going, where legacy is going, where right is going. And they decided to send E.I. DuPont to the United States. And he landed in Connecticut. And he built a munitions factory. Because that's what he was good at, gunpowder particularly. And it turned out he helped win the war, the Revolutionary War, by creating gunpowder that didn't blow up in the faces of the people firing the gun, but it blew forward. Now, I'm not much in favor of war as a metaphor, but it's a helpful way for you to see that we learned something about DuPont, which was that the way he built that factory was adjacent to his own house, so that if anything blew up there, it would affect his family. That's how sure he wanted to be about they could do it safely. He believed he could manage risk in a way that you only built and exploded what you intended to. We discovered that the real essence of DuPont is managing risks. And it had known that they, we had known for years that they had refused to make anything they couldn't manage safely. They refused to do any project that they couldn't do safely. They wouldn't transport things they couldn't do safely. In fact, they were so good at it and so respected, people began to come to them and say, teach us how to be that safe. 200 years later, and they created a business on teaching people safety. So we began to look at which businesses really are the highest risk and they need to be able to manage risk. And those are the businesses we should be in. I say we because when you do this work with people, you become a part of them, right? So you don't get to just go away. So we begin to sell off all sorts of things and say, where is the risk that needs to be managed? Well, we need to manage the way they're doing uh, farmed fishing because it's starting to damage the oceans. That's a huge risk. What if we got in the business of figuring out since we're already in farming and fishing, what if that became what we worked on and it would be the right thing to work on? So you begin to change it. Now that seems very strange. I mean, how does it relate to doing gunpowder? But you can see that E.I. DuPont, who began to question whether he was doing the right things, and so did his family, and he was very good at something. And he came here, and you could begin to see that he was working to manage risk. It's still there now, 215 years later. 
And so now they're beginning to guide the business from that. And it's very different than the hottest topic or just throwing out anything. So you get a little sense of how important it is to know your essence. So the next thing is, oh, let me give you the example of Jeffrey Hollander. So some of you in here probably know I worked with Seven Generation for about five years and we took them from a little business that mostly nobody had ever heard of to a global brand, grew them 40% a year, just in case you want to wonder whether the financials work. <clears throat> gave Jeffrey the platform and the company the platform it wanted to speak about what needed to be spoken about. Created products and offerings which served a loyal, clear group of people rather than anybody who wanted to buy it. And we did it a lot from coming from Jeffrey's Essence and the founding of the company now 25 years ago. Jeffrey's Essence, who is one of the co-founders, as we, and we went back and looked at his story. So part of how I do this is I go back and talk with people about their story, and I won't let them do storytelling because I stop them all the time, but the idea is to get behind, 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 just like we did with DuPont, to what's really there. We found that throughout Jeffrey's entire life, he had been about making things transparent. Even when he was a child, he would run around telling people the bad things he did. Now, what kid does that? <laughs> he wanted to be transparent about every action, whether it was a good action for him or whether he thought he should be in trouble, he thought it should be known. So that tells you a lot about who Jeffrey is today, right? When we went to DuPont, and at least Scott asked Jeffrey, he said, what's the one thing that you would recommend I do? I'm about to start this reverse climate change initiative. And he said, the simple thing is you require every supplier to print on every package, every effect, including everything they externalize. And Lee Scott said, wow, I could do that. And he said, yes, you could. So Lee started with just ingredients, but then he moved to the weight of packaging and the sourcing of packaging. Now, I have a lot of issues still about what Walmart's doing, and part of that is Lee Scott's left, you know, and new leadership comes in, new leadership makes changes. But the ability to understand transparency meant Jeffrey engaged with people that way no matter where he went. The other thing is Jeffrey exposes systemic dissonance. He cannot stand for people to say they're doing one thing and to be doing another. He is willing to go march in front of the White House and be arrested when he sees the White House saying it's doing something and it's not. He's on the board of Greenpeace. So he's willing to put everything on the line to make evident that the dissonance is there and it needs to be transformed. And the last thing is, in spite of the fact that he had a company which was based on environmental products, his heart is in social justice. When he was uh, a teenager, the first business he started, first venture he started was a not-for-profit. And it was all focused on social justice. And he spent two years trying to raise money for it, trying to work on particularly, he worried about the number of uh, people of color, particularly black men who ended up in jail, like one out of six in a, a community. And he felt like something was really wrong and it needed to be changed. But what he found was it was really difficult to do it through a not-for-profit. He was always raising money and he was always working on an issue. So he said, I think we need to work on something more systemic and this is what I've got right now as this business. So we began to look at where the systemic injustice was happening. One of the first projects we worked on was going to San Francisco and working with a group of women, Hispanic women, who were cleaning house with very toxic products. 60% of them had some kind of breathing problem allergies, going toward emphysema if they were older, and it was because of the materials they were using to clean houses. So we formed a partnership and said, how could we educate them about business as well as make sure they get really great products? So we took care of a whole bunch of systemic dissonance which was going on in the system. We helped them all become real entrepreneurs or co-ops where that made sense, and we worked there directly on social justice using what they had. So it's not like you had to go take a business which was making environmentally sound products and suddenly switch it to a social justice business. You just do it with social justice. The next uh, piece that I want to talk about that we need to do is build something called global imperatives. Now global imperatives are not what your mind, which will tend to be, forgive me, will tend to be anthropocentric. It will think all about from a human's point of view. So that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about what you decide the earth needs. 
We're talking about being able to see and feel and know how things work when they are healthy and vital. So here's two examples. These are two that we wrote for Seventh Generation, and I think I have one more for Merida, a little company I'm working with. So here's what they said, and we spent a lot of time working on this. You're getting the output of about six months of work, because it's hard first to get the mind that can do this. We keep on writing, well, so-and-so must happen, or this should be the case, and so we're in our advocacy mind. Rather than we're in the quiet mind, the brain-stilling mind, that sees how things work when they're whole and complete. So seventh generation said, democracy works only with an educated and able citizenry. And all of them in the room felt so strong about that, they said, I think we can impact, we can add to that global imperative. It's not our global imperative, it's the global imperative for democracy. Now, I've worked with people and they've come up with slightly different versions of this and some radically different versions. But the question is, how do things work when they're whole and complete? So the second one they said is, if we're gonna extract resources, and we are, because we're human, we make things, then one of the things that's really important is that it is at the rate and the mode that enables regeneration of a natural system. So it never goes faster, it never works in a way that the system can't regenerate itself. So they knew they could do a lot about that one. So this becomes a part of their corporate direction. So now we've got the essence of seventh generation, right? And we've got a strong sense of the global imperatives that exist that they believe are in the bailiwick of what they can work on. So here is what they worked on, and it's probably evolved a bit since this. Since then, this one's about three years old. But they said the, cur the corporate direction, oh, sorry, this is, yeah, this is the corporate direction which includes the third piece, so I need to give you the third piece. So you notice at the top of that it says the implicate intersections. What does that mean, right? <laughs> so you know what an intersection means, you know, where things come together that haven't been together before, or we haven't seen them together. So the way to think about positioning a business is to begin to see where are the naturally occurring patterns that have up until now operated independently, which look like they're beginning to cross over and get more power together. So the world is full of those kind of things. For a long time, the conversation about the earth was some parallel path with a few folks. I'm gonna give you an example out of the Genes for Justice group. Can I do that, Angie? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the Genes for Justice group was looking at how it is that they help a group of women, initially, who were um, impacted by the closing of a Levi factory in San Antonio. But they have all this skill at sewing. In fact, they're great craftspeople at sewing. And at the same time, there's an opportunity to put that craft and that artisan capability back to work. There's an opportunity emerging in that genes are worn by every age group from the time, even with diapers, and here I am standing in some 70 years old. So the trend for genes or the pattern of comfort in every age group has started to blend and cross over. And the second crossover, the second intersection that we found is people now care where their clothes are made for the first time. Something like 62% in the last Pew survey when people ask, do you know where things come from in your food your clothing, do you know where they're made? And people would say yes, no, sometimes they say, but do you care? And they said, yes, we want to know. So the intersection, rather than them just generating a lot of people they can sell genes to, is to look at how it is we take this pattern that's moving of everybody wearing jeans, no matter what age. It's really about the casualness, the ability to be distinctive, even in a, a setting where you still could be casual and have an intersecting with this great change in people wanting to know how things are made. What are they made by? Now we have an ability for them to find amazing ways to make a difference when we couple it with their essence, which we're still working on, right? Still coming back to what the essence is, but it's, so pulling these together. So you're finding, so let me do all three again. So you're finding the essence of a business. Who is it uniquely? Who is it distinctively? 
who is it that nobody else could be? If it went out of business, it'd be noticed because it didn't exist anymore. What are the global imperatives that you're aware of that you can impact in your business? And it takes quite a bit of time to articulate these, as Community Source Capital found out, right? Still working on how do you articulate these? Because the ego gets involved and wants to tell the earth what it needs, wants to tell democracy what it needs. It's very hard because the brainstorming mind wants to go to work instead of the brainstilling mind that wants to read and see, and it's a much more receptive process. And then third, you begin to, holding both of those in mind, look at where these core intersections are. I call them implicate because they're still implied. They're not explicate yet. They're not uh, made evident. They're still implied, and you have to see them, and you have to read them as they're coming together and then find the place to position you. So seventh generation, this is where they came to. They began to look at the major intersection. When we started to work there, what they were doing is looking at the environmental community. And they were say, trying to sell to all the ranges of green people. Not physically green, but you know, mentally green. <clears throat> they were trying to create a range of products which would go from the newbie into the green market to the deep green. They were trying to create a whole, everything that could be related to green that used any material they had, everything from paper to, to surfactants. They were just expanding endlessly. And Jeffrey was starting to try and figure out, because he is an endless ideator, as all of you are, all of you entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs are. He had a million ideas, including a way to move completely into commercial markets. Let's go do hotels. Let's go do office buildings. Maybe we should start a cleaning business, right? And we said, but what's the essence of you? What are the global imperatives? And they came back to saying, you know, our intersection is where personal and family comes together with ecological health and vitality. That's our intersection. What happens is people are going toward green, they go, the ones that do it most deeply, because they want their children to be healthy, because they want their house to be healthy. And if they understand that in addition, it is consistent with ecological being healthy. Now we have a stable market, and that's how we grew up 40% a year, was going from do everything for anybody, or anything for everybody, either way, to who is it that we really work for, and who do we make a difference with? So let's back up and look at what the guidelines are for you now. So the first is you need to work on revealing your essence. Now this is not something you figure out in terms of uh, a decision-making process. It is something you discover. It is something that you go back and look at the essence of the founders, who you are, asking what really drives how you do things, what really positions, what kind of character you have in terms of the purposes you serve and what values you deeply serve. So you have to do that work, and I do that with every business very early, if not first, very early. So you need to do that with your business if you haven't. And then you need to have dialogues that bring about global imperatives into your, bring global imperatives into your awareness. And you want to make them into statements that describe how things work when they're really the way all stakeholders benefit. You want to reveal the intersections that are emerging but are not yet evident. But they require your business. I mean, it's just calling out for your business. Come sit there, just like it was for seventh generation. Come be here. We need someone at this intersection. And that quiet looking and starting to reveal those patterns is when really amazing new businesses get started. Because they see the intersection, they know who they are and how to fit, and if they want to do it responsibly, they're constantly thinking about the global imperatives. Then you create a corporate direction that coalesces those and singularly positions you in the market. I didn't say competitively positions you in the market. It singularly positions you in the market. So this is the full statement that seventh generation used for its final um, corporate direction. We are the authentic voice, because now you can see the transparency, the systemic dissonance, right? We're authentic, people can trust us. We're the authentic voice for optimizing wellness and intelligence. So now we also have the global imperative of democracy doesn't work. 
unless people are intelligent. So they knew that everything they were going to do was going to be related to educating people at the same time they were bringing something so authentic and so transparent and so clear that people would know they could trust it. And we were able to build a nation or a tribe of followers because of that authentic voice. And they'll do it through sustainable personal and home care systems. They called it healthy homing. They also knew that it couldn't just be seventh generation's products were in this system, that it had to include everyone who was making those products, and you had to educate all of them. So they formed consortiums, worked with Whole Foods, created a sense of what the system looks like and the solutions look like, not just for seventh generation, but for everyone who is involved in cleaning. <clears throat> and this is their final part, which is what Jeffrey really wanted, which is we can raise the platform from which, from which we can influence corporate responsibility as articulated in the global imperatives of educated citizenry and planetary regeneration. That's a mouthful. But they worked on those words so hard. <laughs> and they mean something to them every time they read them, and that's what really matters. And I'll give you a copy of this if you end up wanting one, because I'm not going to stay here long enough for you to get it written down. So what I'd like for you to do right now, I would like for you to think about your own business. To take a few moments, hopefully you can stay just a little while. Um, and I'm gonna have you do this exercise in a minute. Um, and then I'm gonna engage you with it. I'm gonna give you just a little more input before we do. But here, I'm gonna leave this up. So the exercise is gonna be, what's your first cut, your first thinking, on what's the essence of your business? Just sit here and ask. What's really core to how we do things? What's kind of like the meta level behind everything we do? What is it that we seek to produce in the world that uniquely we are producing, not in terms of products, but the nature of character, the nature of um, result that we're seeking to bring into the world? What is the, the deepest value we believe will result? Not a list of them. There's no list on any of this. There's one short, single, not brainstormed, or brain-stilled answer. So I'm gonna ask you to play with that. And then I'm gonna ask you just, even though you're not gonna have very long, to play with what would global imperatives look like if you could get your ego out of the way and the anthropocentric view of the world and say, what is it that really the earth is? How does it work when it's being whole and complete? How does democracy work when it's whole and complete? So I'll give you a, an example here that I'm playing with in the, the new book that I'm doing right now in The Responsible Entrepreneur. If you can really go look at the systems we have and ask what is really their essence, you start to get toward global imperative. So if you were to think about just a moment, if the Internal Revenue Service as an organization ask, what is our essence and what is the nature of system we should bring about most of you would, you know, our first thoughts are, well, get rid of it, or change it so it's fair and equitable, or, you know, there are a lot of thoughts, but all of those are trying to move from existence, right? They're not from potential. What if the essence of the Internal Revenue Service was increasing wealth, I didn't say money, increasing wealth equitably for every being they serve? What's that for an idea? Would it change radically how they worked? If their whole job was to help increase wealth or build wealth or build a capacity for wealth development for every community, including corporations, including citizens, including small businesses equitably, then would they have enough taxes? <laughs> We'd probably have the money we needed to do things, right? Because we wouldn't be focusing on how we get some from others and how we prevent ourselves from having to pay more. So these are the kind of global imperatives to be thinking about that are related. And for those of you who are working in the financial world, that's one worth considering, right? It's a global imperative worth considering, and how could you affect that? Then start to look at where are the emerging intersections that will be helped by your offering. And finally, you won't have enough time to do this, but at least play with it a little. How would you begin to articulate your corporate direction, which then would provide focus, but it has embedded in it now your essence it has embedded responsibility. So I want to give you one other, um, I just realized I have some copies of the slides I just did. I'm going to pass those around. There's not enough for everybody, but if you'll give us a card, 
uh, or there was an email list going around. We'll make sure you all get one. Um, I have a couple of things which may or may not be helpful to you if you want more beyond today. The Responsible Entrepreneur Institute will have its website up, up and functioning hopefully in three weeks. And it's going to be offering ways to continue this for anyone who says, well, I got some of that, but that went by really fast. Anybody else feel like that went by really fast? And I probably got 10% of it, but I know there was something there, and I think I'd like to get more. We're going to give you a way that you'll be able to come see this film video. You will be charged for it when that happens, but it's not going to be a lot. We're trying to, and then when you buy it once, you get it for life. So there's no trick that, you know, and it will be on a live streaming way. So we're going to have ways that you can follow up with this. And there are ways for people who really would like to have more help. Some people just jump in and do this. And what I just gave them and watching the video again, they're good. Got it. Thank you. And other people say, well, not so good. Not so much. I feel like that I need help. And so we have ways that you can get help in a very limited way. And the materials that we've got will tell you about that. And it can either be individualized or we have cohorts which you can join if you want where multiple people are doing it together. And those are starting uh, the first weekend, first week of April, and then they run for a few weeks together. And some of it's done on the phone, and some of it's done in intensive, so we're about six months. So if you're interested in those, you can get a lot of help from your colleagues, as well as from me and a couple of my colleagues, in helping to take this the next round. But you know what? You may have just enough from doing this, and I'm perfectly fine if you do. I have no need for anybody to go further if you can just take it and run. But I also know I end up all the time with people saying, I need a little more. So we've this time been a little better prepared, and I'll offer you more. So I'm going to make these available if you want. I also have a list of the 24 lecture series and the dates and the subjects, right? So you could get signed up in advance. And ideally, you get to show up at all of them, but if you find a friend and could share, that would be great. You can share the content, and I always will have at least a copy of the, the PowerPoint for you to walk away with. Um, there will also be in here not only the 18 questions for an entrepreneur, but the six capabilities you need to answer them. So there's work you have to do on yourself, sorry. Most of us don't have yet the mind or the capability to answer them really well. I mean, you can feel a little of that when I'm posing. You're saying, whoa, those are really big questions. But there's capability building that we'll be talking about here and how you do it. And there's also uh, personal development that I'm finally going to be running in Seattle. I run them in New York City. I run them in Boston. I run them in Santa Fe. And I run them in San Francisco. We're going to run one in Seattle to work on that. So if anybody wants to know that, i got a few pages. I figure most of you are perfect and you don't need that. But anybody <laughs> who feels like they would like to work from potential, these are not personality fixing. These are not things to find out what's wrong with you. It is not therapy. I don't believe that's the way to grow ourselves. I believe it's finding out what your essence is and blowing the world apart with that. So that's what the personal development is about. So if you're interested in that, and I'll pick up questions in just a moment. 